So Benny asked an important question this week. What role does critical thinking play in new media? As consumers, as creators, as educators? First, a bit about me. Hi, my name is Sam Sloan, currently a graduate student at Southern Illinois University Carbondale with an interest in performance studies and new media. First, a bit about new media. Now here I'm going to use the term new media to describe the discernible shift in an information economy that's been going on since, well, a couple decades before the turn of the 21st century. For a great example of this, check out the infographic URL that I have below called Internet Habits Then and Now, 2002 versus 2012. What this infographic does is it shows the growth of the internet in the last 10 years, from 2002 to 2012. We see the number of internet users rise substantially from 569 million or 9% of the world's population to 2.27 billion or 33% of the world's population. Internet usage every day goes from 46 minutes a day to 4 hours a day. Total websites existing on the internet, 3 million to 555 million. We also see the speed that it takes to download, say, a song in 2002, 12.5 minutes to 18 seconds. We also see social networking explode from Friendster in 2002 with a whopping 3 million viewers to Facebook with 900 million users in 2012. So what we see with this infographic is this explosion of digital content of the way that people are now not just using digital technology, but using as a primary medium for both social, interpersonal, and, well, any kind of interaction. Now, one could trace alternative histories of any variety of mediums thought to be, at one time, new. Uh, television, radio, cinema. And one could also fragment the digital new media that I'm about to talk about into very specific technologies. Technologies like web browsers, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, RSS feeds, MySQL, database technologies, XML, blogging, web video, etc. And platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Reddit, Dropbox, maybe some oldies, right, like Napster, MySpace, Friendster. All of these things that have worked together to enable a digital information economy. Now, what started as a convenient form of communication and collaboration for universities and government quickly became a site of interpersonal exchange, the Internet, a repository for collective cultural memory. Love it or leave it, faith is put into web projects like Wikipedia, the Internet Archive, Flickr, Creative Commons, and every single website that harbors, with varying degrees of usefulness, cultural texts. Academics, knowledge workers, are more likely to get their articles, compose their works, and disseminate them via digital technologies. We may largely produce print publications, but in my own classes, students are increasingly asking for Kindle documents, PDFs, or alternative versions of textbooks and class materials. This is to say that we're beginning to invest or puzzle through a new kind of infrastructure, an infrastructure where knowledge is readily available, tagged, and sometimes understood in a 140 characters or less. The focus on knowledge work is de-emphasized in particular kinds of ways. Students are less likely to want to memorize specific facts or be able to tell, I don't know, the history of the First World War from memory. Ah, so here might be great trouble for our educational environment or great opportunity for a critical instructor to step in, right? In a critical framework for education, one is likely to eschew a banking model for other modes of inquiry, the focus being on training students to think for themselves and to think through a body of literature in a process-based way, rather than thinking on the literature in some sort of self-deluded transmission model where everything is understood one-to-one. -one. Critical pedagogy, right? What this opens up room for are things like something I look at, remix practices. We could apply these to education. Now by remix I mean the ability for any student, in this case, to take cultural artifacts, cultural texts, and recombine them in meaningful, aesthetic ways in order to simultaneously speak back to and participate in culture making, or culture jamming, if you will.
Assignments which focus on digital remixing might involve the following functions cutting, pasting, copying, and recontextualizing, that is, doing things like photoshopping or video editing, recombining cultural texts in order to comment or speak back to them. Now the old model response, cutting, pasting, quoting, would be to write a paper. Now a student paper can definitely be a dialogic communication with text. In fact, I, I don't think I'd be stretching to say that this is the way most of the quote-unquote new legitimate knowledges were made in the 20th century educational system, particularly in the humanities. But what is this method? Let's see, it's, it's engaging in the conversation of an academic field, while perhaps also simultaneously looking for new avenues down which to take current ideas. Of course, there are other models, uh, models of performance, for instance, where embodied engagement with an object of study can enhance appreciation of a subject and create new embodied knowledges in the participant. Now, on a practical level, a remix assignment, let's say in the digital age, might look something like this. To explain how we experience simulacra in the world, take a screen capture or a picture of a website where you see evidence of Baudrillard's ideas of simulation. Then, maybe using an app on your phone or tablet or using a website like quickmeme.com, make an image macro that reveals the hypocrisy or shows the hidden power relations behind that simulation. Then, post these up on a new media social website, something like Tumblr, Twitter, or Facebook, or on a blog, or some other site, so that we can see and share them as a class. If we wanted to use that performative engagement, an assignment that engages the performative body might look like this. To engage with the concept of nonverbal communication, look for eight examples of nonverbal communication being performed as you browse around the web and things like images, videos, profile pics, image macros, memes, etc. Copy or screen capture each of these into a folder and make each copied pic into a scene, a short scene, that fits into a story inside your head. Then come to class and perform each of the scenes nonverbally and have the class guess your story. Now, there are a lot of different permutations and ways you might go about making these kinds of assignments, but my point here is that we as scholars can embrace these new technologies and mediums in our classrooms, just as students embrace them in everyday life. As academics, we get to figure out and defend what things like digital quoting, perhaps, and digital citation will look like in the 21st century. Just as we did with ink and text publications in the 20th and early 21st century, we get to make a stand in the classroom that says, hey, there's a legitimate fair use value and great cultural salience when our assignments blur the borders of the classroom and the greater world. We get to say, hey, maybe there's pedagogical value in remixing everyday life, since fair use is covered in the classroom. The late, great John T. Warren was fond of saying that the world is a classroom, or rather, that the classroom is not separate from the quote-unquote real world. With this in mind, as educators, we have the ability to influence and engender public intellectualism by letting our students open digital conversations with the classroom of the world and pay attention, listen to what bounces back. And I believe that that's participation. That is publishing. That is dialogic communication in the 21st century. Thank you.